I call this meeting of the Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law Committee to order. Uh, we will start with the roll call. We are meeting remotely under House Rule 10.01. Uh, Anna, please go ahead with the roll. Hairbecker Finn. Present. Representative Moeller. Present. Representative Scott. Representative Feist. Present. Representative Frazier. Present. Representative Grossel, excused. Representative Herr. Present. Representative Hollins. Present. Representative Johnson. Present. Representative Liebling. Present. Representative Long. Present. Representative Mortensen. Present. Representative Novotny. Present. Representative Farr. Present. Representative Robbins. Present. Representative Bang. Representative Zhang. Present. And Representative Scott. All right, thank you. A quorum is present. Uh, Representative Liebling, do I have a motion to approve the minutes for March 2nd? So moved. All right, thank you. Representative Liebling moves approval of the minutes for March 2nd, 2021. Uh, any discussion to the minutes? All right, seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, the minutes for March 2nd, 2021 are approved. Uh, members, we have a, a full agenda today. We're, we're hoping to get through as much as we can uh, so we don't have to push over into tomorrow's hearing. So we will get right to it. Uh, the first bill on our agenda is House File 660. It is a Representative Richardson bill. Um, I do want to remind members that uh, the part of this bill that is under our jurisdiction would be Section 2 of the bill uh, regarding uh, data collected for studies. And so with that, I will move uh, Chair Richardson's bill. I move that House File 660 be recommended to be referred uh, to the Health Finance and Policy Committee. Uh, Chair Richardson, your bill is before us. Please tell us about your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. House File 660 is a bill that takes some important steps forward in addressing the persistent and unacceptable outcomes we continue to see in Minnesota and around the nation. The data is troubling. Black women are three to four times more likely to die during pregnancy um, uh, or childbirth related deaths than white women. To put it another way, black women are 243% more likely than white women to die of uh, pregnancy or childbirth related causes. Another startling fact is that the majority of these deaths, over 60% of them are preventable. While the general public may assume that Black women have higher risks of complications uh, during pregnancy solely because of poverty or education, research proves that assumption incorrect. When you control for general health, education, income, and, and other factors such as marital status um, and access to insurance, Black women are still more likely to suffer serious complications and death. In fact, Black college-educated mothers were uh, more likely to suffer maternal mortality and morbidity compared with others who never graduated high school. In addition, at every income level, we see these disparities. The near-death experiences of Beyonce Knowles and Serena Williams brought national attention to this issue. In the case of Serena Williams, she recounts being in a hospital room and beginning a gasp for air after an emergency C-section. She got out of bed, flagged down a nearby nurse to alert them something was seriously wrong and that she believed she needed a CT scan to check for blood clots. The nurse disregarded her request, believing she was confused from her medications. Eventually, a doctor arrived to, and performed an ultrasound, not the CT scan she requested. The ultrasound revealed nothing. She continued to ask for a CT scan. Eventually, the doctors relented, followed her request, and the scan revealed several blood clots in her lungs. They immediately began medication. However, with a delay, the intense coughing she experienced caused by the embolism um, caused her to rip her C-section wound, and she went into emergency surgery where doctors discovered a hematoma, and a six-day medical crisis followed. And while William's story brought national attention, there are the names of so many others that you don't know, women who pleaded for help and who were not heard, 
women like Amber Rose Isaac, who pleaded for help before her death, or Shaisha Washington, who voiced concerns over and over again with doctors and nurses where she was ignored. She died shortly after posting her concerns on social media. The research, the heartbreaking stories of loss, tell us that Black women cannot educate their way out of this problem by earning advanced degrees. We cannot healthcare access our way out of this problem, nor can women's income levels buy their way out of this problem. It tells us that something is inherently wrong with a system that's not valuing Black women's lives equally to white women's lives. We have an ability to change that reality. This bill would expand maternal studies to also include mor morbidity studies or what they call the near misses where an individual almost dies. The definition of, mor of morbidity aligns with the C Center for Disease Control. This is a national uh, tragedy and one that impacts Minnesota and we are not doing all the research we can to address these disparities. Examination of maternal morbidity provides an opportunity to identify points of intervention for quality improvements in maternal care and an assessment of range of resources needed to prevent and manage these conditions. By studying morbidity cases, we have the opportunity to translate research into practice and improve pregnancy outcomes for everyone by advancing clinical practices and processes. Today, I have with me Brittany Wright to provide some uh, testimony as well. All right, thank you, Chair Richardson. Uh, Ms. Wright, uh, please introduce yourself for the record and then go ahead with your testimony. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Brittany Wright. Uh, thank you to the chair, Representative Richardson, for inviting me, and uh, good morning to all of you. Um, I gave birth October 3rd, 2018, in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, I had just given birth and or just moved to the state at the time that I moved and was not surrounded by family and friends. Um, I'm a, a native of the Twin Cities community and um, when I moved to Boston, I had to look up which hospital or birthing center was the least likely to let my child and I die. Because for women who look like me, the rates of giving birth in this country are abysmal. And if you're wondering if there's any magic statistic or number or algorithm that you can type in to find out which hospital uh, has the fewest disparities and the fewest amount of biases, there is none. That type of data doesn't actually exist and the hospitals that do actually participate in reporting that data and researching that data typically are not forthcoming with it. And so for an expecting mother like me in my third trimester when I should have been preparing for nesting and I should have been preparing for the birth of my child, the happiest moment of my life, I had to face the possibility and the consequence of birthing while Black, which is death. And for me, obviously, I'm here, and so that was not my fate, but I do fall into that second category of morbidity, the near deaths, the injuries. While I was in labor, I developed an intrapartum fever. The fever crossed the placenta, and my child was born with a fever. I gave birth with a fever. There was a point in my delivery where uh, the fever had taken over my body, and I lost control of myself my ability to speak. I began convulsing and could not communicate to my nurses or my doctors what was happening with me. Had my husband not been in the room, I'm not quite sure what would have happened to me. When I went to my postpartum visit at six weeks, which is standard for women who give birth, uh, my doctor said that, you know, the fever, while it was challenging, uh, was really the only other complication that I faced. Uh, a little bit of, you know, um, separation from my abs, things of that nature, but nothing out of the ordinary. From her standpoint, I was healthy. Well, because we don't do so enough research when it comes to mothers who face injuries or complications during birth, uh, I was given a stamp of approval and no longer had to return to that medical facility because by their definition, I was healthy. When in fact, I returned to that same medical institution 56 times within the first year of my daughter's life. That is how ill I became after giving birth. When we fail to do the research on birthing parents, we leave mothers vulnerable to so many different complications within the first year of their child's life and even beyond. My child is now two and a half and I'm still navigating the complications of having given birth, health issues that I did not have prior to pregnancy. The research could help save women's lives because the way that our system is set up right now, you have a six week postpartum visit and due to our existing system, that's it. 
And so for some women, they don't even realize how their bodies have shifted and been impacted and injured until they experience pregnancy again, which then makes them more high risk and the cycle continues. As Representative Richard mentioned, uh, socioeconomic status doesn't save anyone. Oftentimes when we hear the statistics of black maternal mortality and morbidity, there comes with a bias that perhaps if the mother had done something different or you know, perhaps if she made a certain amount of money that things would save her. Uh, but my husband at that time made well over six figures when I gave birth. I had just graduated from a Ivy League school literally two months before I had given birth. None of those things saved me. None of those things helped uh, me receive better care and none of those things kept me from having a smoother postpartum experience. And when you think about the stress and the financial burden and the uh, interpersonal burden of having an ill and injured mother taking care of a newborn baby, for anyone who's taking care of a child, you already know how difficult it is. And then when you add in the factors of not having a medical system that supports the natural process of having birth and the natural complications that may come from it, we put increased stress on birthing parents and birthing families, which can lead to further disparities. So my ask for all of you in considering whether or not to vote to move this project forward is to think about, we're just talking about preventing mothers from dying and not being severely injured during birth. Birth as our basic human right, which is actually the floor when you think about it. If we say, oh, well, you know, at least you didn't die. That's the floor. We have to be able to raise our standards of birth and care and practices in this country, and particularly in the state of Minnesota. And we have an opportunity to do that with this bill. We, didn't, we need to reimagine the way that we think about birthing, postpartum support, and overall the holistic care of mothers. We have an opportunity to go from Black maternal health disparities where women are constantly dying and, and becoming injured to having empowering birthing experiences. Each and every one of us is here because someone chose to bring forth life into the world. Let's not punish mothers by telling them that they're not valuable enough to have their health monitored and to have their experiences lifted up in a way in which a system can be built around them to support them. So I thank you all for your time and your consideration and uh, I will yield my time back to the floor. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Wright, for, for sharing your really personal story. I think it's important that people realize um, that this, these, these things have real impacts on real people and, and that matters. So thank you very much for sharing your story with us today. Um, Chair Richardson, I don't have anyone else uh, on the testifier list. Is there, are, is anyone else here to testify for this bill? I don't, I don't believe think so. Are. Okay, all right. I uh, just want to make sure. Uh, thank you, Chair Richardson. Uh, we'll go to member discussion. Uh, Representative Scott. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, sorry, I was late this morning. I'm at my daughter's house in Wright County and wanted to make, I didn't quite have her internet password to get on. So sorry about that. Um, no, uh, thank you for your testimony this morning and kind of the, these are really startling stories and um, kind of the reason that this bill is in our committee today is to look at the data provisions and what information will be going to the Minnesota Department of Health. And um, as all of you know about me, I have great concerns about the amount of um, health, personal health information especially linkable to specific people, health information that goes to the Minnesota Department of Health, who they share it with, um, all those types of things. Um, and so my question to the author, um, after talking to Senator Benson over in, um, over in the Senate, who chairs the Health and Human Services Committee, is I'm wondering why this data, um, isn't, well, I guess the question is, is it or is it not already collected by the um, all payer claims database uh, that um, I'm not in love with either, but at least the information there is de-identified um, and you couldn't trace it back to specific people. Uh, Chair Richardson. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. So I think I would, you know, just start by saying that um, Right now, currently, 
there's the mortality data that is that that is currently um, being collected. And with what we're asking to do here, we're asking to expand it again to the morbidity and the near misses. And in terms of the um, uh, you know the the concerns of you know the data and and being um, uh, de-identified. I definitely uh, hear those concerns. I think that there is a um, public health uh, argument to be made here, especially with what we see within uh, the deep the disparities. Is to say that um, without this research, we will continue to see um, uh, black women be three to four times uh, more, more likely to die uh, during childbirth. Um, and those statistics to me are just not acceptable, uh, especially in light of the fact that 60% uh, percent or more of those uh, deaths could be prevented. And the more work that we do from um, understanding those near misses, because there are definitely, in terms of the number of cases, near misses are much more uh, likely occurrences than when we're thinking about mortality. And so by not collecting this data, uh, people, people will die and people will continue to die because the learnings that come from this data allow us to think through uh, prevention uh, efforts and to think differently about um, uh, being able to identify uh, risk factors uh, earlier and also being able to see, um, as Ms. Wright uh, testified to, where the issues are. Because right now, in terms of even being able to collect data around specific hospital or clinic data, we don't have that, uh, we don't have that ability as it relates to uh, mortality. So I think there's a balancing act here uh, between the data privacy piece and um, the work that has been happening right now, I think around the nation to really address this issue, which is uh, entirely uh, able to be addressed and to be uh, prevented. And the department may have um, more that they want to add, Madam Chair, if you would uh, indulge them in terms of uh, different ways that data could potentially uh, be collected. Um, I know we have several people from MDH here this morning. So whoever wants to take that one, uh, if you could introduce yourself for the record and then go ahead. Um, good morning, um, Madam Chair. My name is Karen Fogg. I'm from the Minnesota Department of Health. And um, Chair, our Representative Richardson did an excellent job of describing why um, de-identified data is insufficient for this type of study. Um, De-identified data does not allow us to consider um, factors beyond what's in, the, what's in that database, including specific, um, um, specific situations that might have occurred to that, um, that person, um, such as the experience of, of racism um, in, a, in, a, in a system. So the things that we like to look at when considering um, a, more, a mortality review might include services that person, that individual received from multiple locations. So not just what happened to that person during labor delivery or, or the time of death, but we're thinking that we are looking for information outside of the medical system about what might have contributed to that, um, to that unfortunate event. And the all, all, all players claims data does not provide that same sort of information. Um, Representative Scott, follow up. Thank you, Madam Chair. So my question to either the bill's author or to Ms. Fogg would be, um, since this is not de-identified data, um, that would they be open to having people um, be notified um, or maybe an ability to opt out or opt in to this research? Because this is research. And normally when people um, are going to go under their information is going to be um, used for research. Um, they are fully informed. There's a Tennyson warning given um, to these people so that they know that their information is going to be used for research purposes. And then so I wonder if um, the department and the bill's author would be open to something like that. So there may be people that don't want to give this information to the Minnesota Department of Health. Um, and so I want to, you know, be honoring of that. 
Um, you shouldn't be forced to give your information, especially this personalized, de-identified information. Um, so would the department or the bill's author be open to something like that? And then, um, you know, when they're, I, I think that there should also be ability for, um, and this is uh, the way it is with other, um, particularly medical information, is people can request the department to destroy the data if they no longer want it to be held by the department for some reason. Um, so there's those two provisions, and then just how long does the department plan to keep the data? Um, is this is this going to be forever that they're going to keep the data? Will it be um, destroyed after a while? Will it be de-identified after a while? I guess those are all questions that I have, Madam Chair. If somebody could answer them, please. Thank you. Yep. And uh, Representative Scott, I think we're we're going down the path of a whole bunch of questions that uh, I know I had to quick take take notes on on all the questions. So I think the first question I think is to Chair Richardson about uh, potential of uh, opting out or tennis and warnings. Uh, Chair Richardson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Representative Scott. And um, and my understanding is that there are notices that are um, mailed out regarding. Um, uh, you know, to, to individuals who would be impacted. And I think that the department can definitely um, uh, expand on that um, as well. Um, in terms of, you know, the other questions related to sort of um, how long to keep data, those would be things I think would be better uh, addressed by uh, Ms. Fogg or um, another of the MDH uh, individuals who are online. All right, uh, we'll go to Ms. Fogg first. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and Representative. Um, Representative Richardson did, did describe accurately that we send out um, notices. If, you'll, if you see in the text of the bill um, that's currently already in statute that the commissioner shall make a good faith reasonable effort to notify the subject of the data or in this case of a, of a mortality, the um, subjects uh, parents, spouse, or other other family members. So we do take that very, very seriously and send out um, formal letters to um, to families. Um, we also take um, great care in protecting this data. Um, uh, representative, we agree with you that this is very, very sensitive data, and these are extremely unfortunate events, and we do everything in our power to protect the information that we are given. Um, I am not a lawyer, so I can't answer all, all of some of your detailed questions, but I'd um, be happy to consult with some of our team members to talk more about some of your questions about um, some of your more detailed questions. Um, I, and I can answer some information. I can provide some more information to you about how long we keep these records. Um, it's, you know, this is, we, we really take data privacy very, very seriously in these cases, and it's not our intention to keep the very detailed information um, for long periods of time. We do abstract each case or take relevant information out of each case and, um, and put it into a, a secure database to analyze that data, and it becomes more summary de-identified data, and that, that data is actually what, what we use, and um, the, the portion that we ever use only ever, the only portion we ever use publicly is the de-identified combined summary data, never, um, you know, doing our very best to never reveal anything that, that to the public that might um, um, de uh, identify the case at all. We're, we're combined multiple years together in these statistics to protect um, this data in every way possible. Madam Chair, just right. one follow-up, if I might. Yep, real quick, Representative Scott, we've got a lot well, to cover today. I, I understand, but th this is an important bill. This is, a, this is medical information. There's nothing more sensitive, and that's why this bill's in our committee. I think it needs to be vetted. Um, my question to the department is, in the information that you, the letter that you send out to the patient, are they given a Tennyson warning that their information is gonna be used for research? And uh, I guess if you could ask, answer that question if you know the answer. Uh, Ms. Fogg, uh, real quick. Yeah, uh, Madam Chair Representative, I don't have the letter in front of me, but that is something that I can send a template to you, Representative, um, for you to take a look at, and we can confirm the contents of that letter. I, I'd appreciate, Madam Chair. Rep Representative Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I would appreciate that. I, 
I will vote for this bill today, but with hesitation because this stuff, these questions need to be answered to protect people's data. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yep, and to be clear, members, I'm not trying to cut off debate. I just want to keep us focused so that uh, we can we can get to all the work we need to do today. Um, I know this is going to uh, you know we're not sending this to to Ways and Means of the General Register yet, and uh, I know that Chair Richardson will continue to work with folks to make sure that this this uh, is in in good shape. So with that, uh, Representative Her. Thank you, Chair becker Finn, and, and thank you, uh, Representative Richardson, for bringing this bill forward. I know you and I have talked in the past. Um, we at the City of St. Paul had been working for actually a year on uh, the maternal health outcomes, and I just wanted to just thank you uh, how important this bill is. What we found in that working with two of the largest birth centers in the Twin Cities area here in that work was that there is no central place that data is collected on mor uh, mortality and morbidity, especially with some of the data that you're uh, requesting for this study. And what we found was that it was incredibly difficult to address the issue because there is no data. And in our search across the country, the only place that we found that had data was California. And they um, had a, a system in which there was a voluntary base uh, to be uh, to have information collected. But even then, you know, in a, you know, when we don't provide consistency and uh, requirements for the data that is being collected, the data becomes really unuseful because everybody's collecting data differently and everybody is providing different information. And so I just wanted to say thank you for bringing this bill forward. Um, the absolutely, uh, it's absolutely needed and it has been far too long that we have allowed this issue to persist and that get, having giving birth to a child should be the most wonderful and beautiful time of your life. And yet uh, for uh, our black and brown women who experience this issue of racism, regardless of their income or their education, it's just really for us, we should be, um, uh, just appalled by uh, the conditions of which we've created for this. So I just really wanted to just say more of thank you because I have done the research. We uh, have done projects and, and followed, tried to look for data and tried to work with the hospital associations uh, to see how this has been done in the past and how, how the healthcare system is working together to address this. And though they, this is something that they are starting to work on, there is no data to again support the work. And so I just wanted to say thank you so much Representative Richardson for bringing this forward. Uh, thank you, Representative Her. Um, I will also say to uh, the MDH staff that are on the call is in the future, if we have bills that are coming to this committee that um, reference a notice or or any kind of uh, something that needs to be in writing like that, it would be helpful to be prepared with that uh, when you come to this committee. So kind of a note to authors as well um, to make sure we're having really productive discussions here in this committee. Uh, Representative Hollins. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first of all, thank you, Representative Richardson, um, for bringing this bill forward. This is something that's really personally important to me. Um, and I guess my question is based on my own personal experience, having had a child with no complications and then going to the ER less than a week later um, because of a fear of a blood clot that happened. And sort of related to that, how are we planning on tracking that information? I believe Ms. Fogg got to it a little bit, but I'm really interested because I know that happens a lot where um, it's not at the hospital when you give birth, but it's following that situation that um, these emergency situations arise. And frankly, not even enough information is often taken when you go to the ER for them to make that connection that this could be related to childbirth and labor um, and all of those sorts of things. So I'm really interested in how we're going to track those situations as they go and making sure that they're included in the data that we're collecting. Uh, Chair Richardson. Um, you, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Representative Hollins. You, you raise a really good question because, I mean, even when we're thinking about the mortality data, we look out a year, right, a year postpartum when we're thinking about um, uh, within the mortality piece and um, related to like the morbidity issues. It's a similar, you know, you're looking across a similar uh, span of time in order to be uh, able to uh, collect uh, to collect data uh, related to that, and I. I don't know if Ms. Fogg had something to add uh, uh, briefly. Uh, Ms. Fogg. Thank you, Chair. I don't have anything additional to add at this time. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll get to Representative Liebling and then we do need to get the vote to the vote uh, members to, to keep folks' bills moving. Uh, Representative Liebling. 
Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to chime in a bit. This bill was heard in health. It's going back to health. And um, it's a very important bill. And I really hope that we can get this done this year. But I do want to thank Representative Scott and just say that I do think we need to do a little bit of work on the data provisions before this can really become law. And, um, and I hope that we can continue to work on that as the bill moves. Um, it's going to get laid over for possible inclusion in the health bill. So there's a little bit of time. But when I look at the data provisions of the bill, it looks like the, um, the data collection can go back to, it says, uh, because additional language is being added to the current statute that the um, data collection can go back to 2000. And I'm not sure how that works. I just think, you know, I just wanna kind of put in a plug that we would continue to work on some of these issues because, you know, the idea that it, uh, it is very important to collect the data and I am totally behind the idea of allowing the department to do studies. I think that's critically important as Chair Richardson said, but, but also when a woman has some morbidity around her pregnancy, that you know, under this bill, that automatically triggers her data being turned over. And, you know, that, that is a little bit troubling to me that needs more guardrails around that. So just want to add my voice to that. And thank you very much, Representative Richardson, for your work on this critically important bill. Uh, thank you. Uh, Chair Richardson, thank you very much for bringing this bill forward. I know um, I, oh, there's a lot going on. Uh, things are really busy right now, but if members can can bring up concerns with the author, uh, you know, before we get to the committee, that can be really helpful as well so that we can have really productive conversations here in committee. Uh, with that, uh, Chair Richardson, any closing words? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to um, have this bill heard. Uh, Representative Scott, happy to continue conversations uh, with you, um, as well as the, the bill is moving. And just in short, um, this work and this bill that I'm bringing uh, today is uh, a very personal bill, and it's in honor of my cousin who begged for her life and her husband who begged for her life. And she was not heard, and she passed away, and it was preventable. And that's troubling to me. So I ask for support. Thank you very much, Chair Richardson. Uh, there are no amendments to this bill. I will renew my motion that House File 660 be recommended to be re-referred to the Health Finance and Policy Committee. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Becker Finn. Aye. Representative Moeller. Aye. Representative Scott. Aye. Representative Feist. Aye. Representative Frazier. Aye. Representative Grossel, excused. Representative Her. Aye. Representative Hollins. Aye. Representative Johnson. Aye. Representative Liebling. Aye. Representative Long. Aye. Representative Mortensen. No. Representative Novotny. Aye. Representative Farr. Aye. Representative Robbins. Aye. Representative Vang. Aye. And Representative Zhang. Aye. There are 15 ayes and one nay. Thank you. With that, uh, the motion prevails and uh, House File 660 is on its way back to the Health Finance and Policy Committee. Thank you, Chair Richardson. Uh, with that, members, we'll move on to the next bill, which is House File 526 uh, from Representative Cleborn. Uh, I will move that House File 526 be recommended to be referred to the Health Finance and Policy Committee. Representative Cleborn, welcome to the Judiciary Committee. Uh, your bill is now before us. Please uh, tell us about your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's an honor to be with you and the members of Judiciary. I think this is the first time I've appeared before this committee. Um, the House File 526 is a technical cleanup bill clarifying the language listing who may obtain a certified record. This bill will modify the list of individuals and entities that may obtain an individual's certified birth or death record. Sorry, I was accidentally muted. Um, I will go back to say that this bill uh, will modify the list of individuals and entities that may obtain an individual certified birth or death record. With me today is Ms. Molly Crawford, the State Registrar of Vital Records, to speak to the bill. 
And Madam Chair, with that, I will ask that you please recognize Registrar Crawford. Thank you very much. Uh, Registrar Crawford, please introduce yourself for the record and then go ahead with your testimony. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I'm Molly Crawford. I'm the State Registrar of the Office of Vital Records at the Minnesota Department of Health. This bill is important because it helps secure access to important vital records, birth and death certificates. The current law um, allows uh, the person who filed the record um, to obtain a legal certificate. This um, is particularly uh, a security issue for birth records. Um, we have examined the need uh, the business need for the people who file records. Typically, this is a hospital birth clerk, a birth registrar. Um, there is no business need for a hospital birth clerk to go and obtain a birth certificate for any of the infants that the birth record was filed at that facility. Uh, this law also pertains to death records and um, ordinarily, funeral directors order death certificates for the families that they are serving. The current law contains language that would allow funeral directors to continue to get the death certificates for the families they serve. This law is important because it secures access to those important legal documents that are identity documents, sometimes referred to as breeder documents. Uh, the law also tightens um, attorney access to these important legal certificates. Not only does an attorney need to be licensed, but the attorney must represent either the subject of the record or one of the individuals who is eligible to get the legal certificate. Um, one final thing that the bill does is it um, improves the language making it more plain language in eliminating the reference to tangible interest so that we can just speak about individuals who are eligible rather than have a tangible interest in the document. Thank you. All right, thank you. We don't have anyone else signed up to testify. Uh, Representative Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'm just wondering if the testifier could kind of give us a little, a little bit of a glimpse into history as to why this was in statute in the first place. Because um, it seems to me that it wasn't, all these other people didn't need to have access, but I'm just curious. Um, thank uh, you. Registrar, Registrar Crawford. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, that's a great question, Representative. Um, vital records have been around a very long time and technology has changed through the years. Um, when vital records were filed, everything was on paper and really the certificate itself was something that was created at a hospital. Over time, this has become electronic, it's data entered into a system. And so we've been able to separate a paper legal certificate from the data that's contained in a record. And so I, I think initially hospitals, um, funeral homes may have had a need to, to keep records of things that they, had a role in registering. Um, and, you know, this came about after examining gaps in our security and trying to prevent um, access that doesn't have a business need. Um, after we audited some of, um, you know, our practices, uh, procedures, and, and laws. Uh, follow up, Representative Scott? Nope. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, um, not seeing any other, oh, Representative Johnson. Well, uh, Chair Becker Finn, Representative Clavin. I, I actually do like this bill. Uh, in law enforcement, one of the issues that we have is identity theft. And one of the main ways to get uh, some of the information for identity theft to get, uh, get loans in other people's name and stuff is obtaining birth certificates. Um, if this can tighten that, that up and make it harder for individuals to obtain uh, the birth certificates of individuals to use for identity theft, I'm all for it. Thank you. 
All right. Uh, any uh, closing comments, uh, Representative Cleborn? Thank you, Madam Chair. And I would just like to say uh, this is a space where Representative Johnson and I are in lockstep. Anything that we can do to protect the identity of individuals is a great day at the Capitol. Um, I just want to thank you, Madam Chair, and the committee for the time this morning and your consideration and discussion of House File 526. And with that, I ask for your support to uh, re refer this bill to health, finance, and policy. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Representative Cleborn. I will renew my motion that House File 526 be recommended to be referred to the Health, Finance, and Policy Committee. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Baker Finn. Aye. Representative Muller. Aye. Representative Scott. Aye. Representative Weiss. Aye. Representative Frazier. Aye. Representative Grossel, excused. Representative Hurt. Aye. Representative Hollins. Aye. Representative Johnson. Aye. Representative Liebling. Aye. Representative Long. Aye. Representative Mortensen. Aye. Representative Navani. Aye. Representative Farr. Aye. Representative Robbins. Aye. Representative Bang. Aye. And Representative Zhang. Aye. There are 16 ayes and no nays. All right, thank you. Uh, the motion prevails and House File 526 is on its way to the Health, Finance and Policy Committee. Uh, thank you, Representative Cleborn, for uh, joining us in judiciary. Uh, we're gonna move right on to the next bill on our agenda today. It is House File 1318, uh, Representative Hansen's bill. I will move, uh, Hansen R. Uh, I will move that House File 1318 be recommended to be referred to the Transportation uh, Policy and Finance Committee. Representative Hansen, we have our your bill before us. Uh, please tell us about your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I'm pleased to be here this morning. Um, several years ago, I was uh, sitting in a coffee shop and I had a constituent come up to me and say, do you know how hard it is to get a replacement social security card? And I said, no, I don't. <laughs> and uh, she proceeded to tell me how difficult it is to get a replacement social security card. And at that time, I believe there were 20 states where you could not get a replacement social security card online. Today, there are five, and Minnesota is one of them. So <clears throat> I'd like you to think about the consequences as we move towards real ID and people having to get their social security card. Now, when I try to find mine, I've got to dig into an old safe deposit box and find it. But what if I changed my name? What if I'd laminated it like many uh, of us old baby boomers did? Uh, what if I can't find it? Uh, what do I, how do I need to get a replacement social security card? So our data practices laws are why we prevent, why we are prevented from getting social security card online replacement. And with COVID, many of the social security offices were closed. So if you needed to get a card, it was an extremely difficult process. Now you may not be aware of this, but I, I would ask you to ask your constituents if they've experienced this. And I think you will find horror stories immediately of people spending extreme amounts of time and energy, very frustrating time trying to get this replacement card. I would ask you if you've got your devices uh, with you just to Google who is eligible to request a replacement social security card online? And you will find a map and almost all of the country, you are able to go online. It's 2021. You are able to go online and get a replacement social security card. The five states that are the remaining are Minnesota, Nevada, New Hampshire, Oklahoma, and West Virginia. We are one of those five states. And our constituents are dealing with this. Uh, I think this is a bipartisan uh, concern. On February 11th, the entire GOP Republican, the Republican Minnesota House delegation in Washington wrote a letter to the leadership of our state saying this is an important issue that needs to get fixed. So I'm asking you, it, it changes two simple lines in uh, Minnesota Statute 171, perform identity verification is allowed for an applicant for a replacement social security card. So I'd ask for your support. I'd ask for your co-authorship and let's do this for our constituents. 
Thank you, uh, Representative Hansen. Uh, it looks like Representative Johnson has a question. Uh, Representative Hansen, uh, uh, Chair Becker, and Representative Hansen, I understand this, and I, I would love to do this. Unfortunately, uh, your bill doesn't clarify between the two different type of driver's license we have. One that actually requires uh, proof of citizenship, uh, with the real ID, actually three, the real ID, the enhanced, which uh, has a lot of documentation to actually prove who that person is. And then we have the um, non-compliant. Uh, with your bill, does the non-compliant driver's license qualify as well? Because I, I have concerns on that. Uh, Representative Hansen. I'm Chair and members, I'd have you uh, take a look on lines 1.14 the limitations of paragraph A do not apply to the extent necessary to maintain compliance with the driver's license compact under section and applicable law governing commercial driver's licenses and perform identif identity verification. So the new language we're adding into that uh, compact so it would allow that without that change, uh, we are unable to do online uh, social security card replacement. Uh, Follow-up Representative Johnson. So in other words, without the uh, enhanced or real ID, the, the uh, non-compliant driver's license would not work. Representative Hansen. Uh, Madam Chair and members, uh, you're in a chicken or the egg situation here. You can't get your real ID without, without a social security card because you can't get into a social security office because they're closed in most cases and you can't get your replacement online. So you can't get your real ID. So therefore it's a circular argument that I think most of our constituents are finding utterly baffling that we cannot do this. Uh, final follow-up, Representative Johnson. Uh, Chair Becker Finn, Representative Hampson, I understand the circle. Um, I believe we're coming to the end of the, the issue with the pandemic. Our numbers are way down. The vaccines are working. A uh, new one came out, uh, I believe it was yesterday. Um, we're, we're at the very tail end of this where things are gonna be opening up. In fact, there's no reason that our social security offices couldn't be open up now to uh, at least by appointment to get that taken care of. But I, I do have a concern when uh, our non-compliant driver's license are allowed for this. It's something that a person has to decide ahead of time whether they want to get a a uh, real ID enhanced or a non-compliant. Um, that is the decision that they have to make and there's consequences with the decisions you make. So I cannot support that at this time. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, I, I will note in my experience living in rural Minnesota that it, uh, you know, sometimes there are barriers to accessing the social security office, even not during a pandemic, even when it's open, especially in our larger rural counties. So um, I imagine that is another factor uh, in favor of this, this bill. Uh, Representative Scott. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair and Representative Hansen. How does the Social Security Administration um, verify, what verification process do they go through now to, um, to replace somebody's Social Security card? Representative Hansen. Madam Chair uh, and uh, Representative Scott, uh, I do not know. Uh, I, I don't know the Social Security uh, inner workings of the Social Security Administration, but if 45 states have figured it out with the Social Security administration, I think Minnesota can too. What's in front of us is this is a state law that is prohibiting Minnesotans from getting their cards at the Social Security Administration. We're representatives of the state government. That's the question in front of us. The federal government has that question uh, and they seem to have figured it out with 45 other states. A follow-up Representative Scott. Um, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, just because 45 other states are doing something doesn't make it, uh, in my opinion, the right thing to do for Minnesota. I share Representative Johnson's concerns amongst others. Um, so I'll be a no on the, on, the, um, on the bill today. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, seeing no further member discussion, uh, any closing words, Representative Hansen? Thank you, Madam Chair. It's uh, 2021 and we're actually debating whether Minnesotans can get a replacement social security card 
online. It's time for this. Most of the country, almost all of the country has figured this out, but I would ask you to talk to your constituents and ask your constituents the, the hassle, the challenges, the frustration that they have experienced because we have not allowed this and vote for the bill and co-author it. All right, thank you, Representative Hansen. Uh, Representative Hollins, I saw your hand went up late, uh, but we're, we're really going to try to keep things moving today. So I'm going to go ahead and renew my motion that House File 1318 be recommended to be re-referred to the Transportation Finance Committee. The clerk will take the roll. Rebecca Finn. Aye. Representative Moeller. Aye. Representative Scott. No. Representative Feist. Aye. Representative Frazier. Aye. Representative Grossel, excused. Representative Herr? Aye. Representative Hollins? Representative Johnson? No. Representative Liebling? Aye. Representative Long? Aye. Representative Mortensen? No. Representative Novotny? No. Representative Barr? No. Representative Robbins? No. Representative Bang. Aye. Representative Zhang. Aye. And Representative Hollins. Aye. There's 10 ayes and six nays. All right, thank you. With that, the motion prevails and House File 1318 is on its way to the Transportation Committee. Uh, thank you, Representative Hansen. Thank you. Uh, with that, members, we're going <laughs> we're going to move on to the next one. Uh, the next one is House File 1493 from Representative Stevenson. Uh, just will remind members that the relevant provisions that we'll be looking at here in the Judiciary and Civil Law Committee uh, can be found in Section 11 of the bill relating to data. Uh, I will move that House File 1493 be recommended to be re-referred to the Commerce Committee. Uh, Representative Steven Stevenson, your bill is now before us. Please tell us about your bill. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the committee, House File 1493 is a bipartisan bill to establish a student borrower's bill of rights uh, and to license and regulate uh, the student loan servicing industry, eliminate some of the worst practices and behaviors of that industry. Uh, as uh, uh, the chair uh, noted, uh, it's before the committee due to section 11, which uh, handles how the data uh, collected and maintained by the Department of Commerce uh, would be uh, handled. Uh, and uh, I think it's a pretty straightforward uh, section of the bill, uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you, Representative Stevenson. Steven assistant, I don't see, uh... Looks like we just have somebody available for questions if members have questions, but we don't have any additional testifiers signed up. Uh, members, any discussion to the bill? Representative Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Stevenson, if you could kind of just walk through, um, I noticed that the, the information can be shared with several um, agencies. If you could just walk through why they would, the why, why would they be sharing this information? What specific data sets they would be sharing and um, if audit trails or anything like that will be kept so that we can make sure that um, this sensitive data is only being shared um, with those that have the absolute um, need in their jobs to um, see it. Representative Stevenson. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Scott, uh, I see that there are five entities with whom the Department of Commerce could share the data. The Department of Education originates federal student loans uh, the Office of Higher Education uh, obviously uh, has relevance uh, in connection with what might be happening at our state institutions of higher education. Uh, the Department of Commerce licenses and regulates uh, the data, plus they would have it in the first place. Uh, the Office of the Attorney General uh, has broad consumer protection powers uh, under uh, Section uh, 8.13 of uh, Minnesota statutes, and so could be involved in enforcing uh, violations of uh, the consumer protections contained in the bill and uh, local, state, and federal law enforcement to the extent that criminal uh, behavior is identified. Uh, the rest of your questions uh, relate, I think, to how uh, you subdivision one of section 11 uh, indicates that uh, collection and uh, receiving, maintain, dissemination is governed by section 46.07. So I think it would be inconsistent with that chapter in law. 
Representative Scott. Um, oops, sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for those answers, Representative Stevenson. All right, members, uh, any further discussion to the bill? Well, to section 11 of the bill. All right, uh, with that, I will renew my motion that House File, oh, uh, House File 1493 be recommended to be referred to the Commerce Committee. Uh, Representative Stevenson, any closing words? It's a good bill, please vote for it. All right, thank you. Uh, the clerk will take the roll. Chair Becker Finn. Aye. Representative Muller. Aye. Representative Scott. Aye. Representative Feiss. Aye. Representative Frazier. Aye. Representative Grossel, excuse. Representative Her. Aye. Representative Hollins. Aye. Representative Johnson. Aye. Representative Liebling. Aye. Representative Long. Aye. Representative Mortensen. No. Representative Novotny. Aye. Representative Farr. Aye. Representative Robbins. Aye. Representative Vang. Aye. And Representative Sean. Aye. There's 15 ayes and one nay. All right, thank you. The motion prevails and uh, House File 1493, Representative Stevenson's bill is on its way to Representative Stevenson's committee. Uh, with that thank members, uh, I am going to uh, pass the virtual gavel over to Vice Chair Muller uh, as the next two bills on the agenda are, are mine. Thank you, Madam Chair. So members, our next bill is Chair Becker Finn's House File 1407 related to student educational data. And Chair Becker Finn, would you like to move your bill to be recommended to be placed on the general register? Uh, so moved, Madam Chair. All right, so your bill is now before us. Please tell us about your bill. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I'm actually gonna pass this to, uh, this is an agency priority. Uh, so I'm gonna pass this over to uh, my testifier. All right, I believe the testifier is Adosh Uni. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Uni. Please introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Madam Chair, my name is Adosh Uni. I'm the Director of Government Relations for the Minnesota Department of Education. And thank you to Chair Becker Finn for carrying this very important bill. The, we've, we've heard this bill in the last legislature and we were able to hear it in, in this committee in the second special session and broadly, this bill would allow, would permit districts and charters to share educational data with tribal nations about their tribally enrolled or descendant students, specifically to support the educational attainment of those students. And what it would do, if you look at the bill on lines 3.21 to 3.23, this explicitly lists the tribal nations as a permitted entity to a list of already existing 17 entities or purposes for which districts and charters are allowed, not required, but allowed to share educational data with for a legitimate educational purpose. And in this case, the legitimate educational purpose would be the educational attainment of the student. Now, currently we have 37 districts and charters that are required to engage in tribal consultation under the federal Every Student Succeeds Act. Many of our districts are doing a great job partnering with their tribal nations or their tribal representative entities like the Tribal Nations Education Committee in the metro area to share data with the, their local education data with the, with the tribal nations and their representatives to be able to look at what is the best type of programming for those tribally enrolled students and their descendant students. However, there are some districts who, uh, based on legal advice, are, are, are determining that because the tribal nations are not listed in that explicit li or in that list under statute chapter 13 and they may not they determine that the tribal nations don't qualify as volunteers under uh, under paragraph J uh, that they're not allowed to share that data with the tribal nations for this purpose um, without some type of consent. So we, we believe that tribal nations would qualify as volunteers or under this list but to to, to address that concern, we've come forward with this proposal that would facilitate the permission in statute explicitly for the districts and charters uh, to have that legal cover to be able to share the data with our tribal nations to really engage in that meaningful tribal consultation for the purposes of enhancing educational programs, looking at the impact of their, of their students and how 
uh, how they are doing and be able to provide the, the advice to the district and charter based on data, based on actual impacts to students at the time in order to support their educational attainment. Uh, and with that, Madam Chair, I believe that covers the, covers the bill and the reason why the department is coming forward on behalf of the Tribal Nations Education Committee and the Tribal Nations um, under HF 1407. And I'll stand for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uni. And I believe Chair Becker Finn, did you uh, have something you wanted to say? Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair uh, Chair Moeller. I, I just wanted to follow up uh, after that description of the bill with just uh, a little bit of personal insight as the parent of uh, Indigenous kids, uh, especially in uh, communities that are not um, primarily other Indigenous kids that, uh, you know, this could also be used uh, as a tool to make sure that our kids are getting some additional supports from their home tribal nations. Um, and so this would make it easier to identify those kids so that they could get that extra support. Um, you know, my own kids are in classes where they are the only uh, Ojibwe kids in their, in their classrooms and um, access to some extra supports through uh, our, our own tribe, even though we're not physically uh, near by could be really helpful to to kids like mine and I think um, you know we have students throughout our state that are from tribal nations from all over the country as, as well and so um, there is many tribes have an interest in making sure that their their students are supported no matter where they live and where they go to school all right I see a question from representative Scott um, thank you, Madam Chair. And it's really more of a comment than it is a question. And I've had conversations with Mr. Uni on this issue. And I just think that the underlying law is, um, my daughter's dog just woke up. <laughs> um, uh, the underlying law, I think, needs to be changed in the fact that I, I would really like to see parents have um, give the consent to have their, their child's student data um, shared. I think that's an important piece of this that's I understand the underlying law supports what's being done here, but that's that's my rub on on um, the issue of of not getting parental consent first. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Scott. Chair Becker Finn or Mr. Uni, did you have any follow up to that? I thank Finn. you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I, yeah, and I think you know that that's sort of a bigger question that Representative Scott brings up. This data is already being shared with different entities, and, and this particular bill is just asking the question: Is if we're sharing that data with these other entities, shouldn't tribal nations also be included on that list? So, uh, you know, understand the concern, uh, but uh, you know, much bigger and broader than what this individual bill does. All right, I don't see any further questions from members of the committee. So with that, Chair Becker Finn renews her motion that House File 1407 be recommended to be placed on the general register and the clerk will take the roll. Chair Becker Finn. Aye. Representative Muller. Aye. Representative Scott. Pass. Representative um, Feiss. Aye. Representative Frazier. Aye. Representative Grossel, excused. Representative Her. Aye. Representative Hollins. Aye. Representative Johnson. Pass. Representative Liebling. Aye. Representative Long. Aye. Representative Mortensen. Aye. Representative Navani. Representative Farr. Aye. Representative Robbins. Aye. Representative Vang. Aye. Representative Zhang. Aye. And Representative Novotny. Pass. Okay, there are 13 ayes. All right, with 13 ayes, uh, the motion prevails and House File 1407 is recommended to be placed on the general register. Our next bill is House File 1404. Again, Chair Becker Finn's bill related to Legislative Commission on Data Practices. Um, some changes to that. So Chair Becker Finn, would you like to move your bill? Uh, yes, thanks, Madam Chair. I would move my bill and then I would move the A1 amendment to House File 1404. All right, and I believe the motion for the bill is that House File 1404 be recommended to be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. 
And then you did mention the A1 author's amendment and you moved that. Do you have anything you wanna say about the author's amendment? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. It, it just gets the bill in the shape that I would like uh, for our discussion moving forward as the motion is for this to be laid over. All right, very well. Do we have any discussion on the motion or on the A1 amendment? All right, seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The A1 amendment is adopted and Chair Beckerfin, please tell us about your bill as amended. Great. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And uh, so House File 1404, uh, for folks who are not uh, familiar, uh, there was an, uh, under the LCC, there was a data practices and personal data privacy subcommittee that expired in 2019. Um, it was the only place where certain audit reports were sent, uh, including license uh, plate reader data and law enforcement. Uh, so essentially, uh, uh, law enforcement camera data was sent for review. Uh, and so now it's the data is still being sent to the LCC, but because the subcommittee uh, expired, it's it's not necessarily being uh, disseminated to anyone else to review. And so uh, what this bill would do is to, to direct that that data um, in the absence of uh, restarting the uh, that subcommittee that the data would be sent to the, the chairs and ranking minority members of both the public safety and uh, the in this case, the judiciary civil law committees that have uh, oversight of uh, data and civil law. So that is the bill as amended and happy to discuss further or answer questions. Thanks, Madam Chair. And I'll just say that I was a member of that um, committee and I know Rep Representative Scott was as well. And um, I thought the work that that committee did was, was really great. And I know there may be separate efforts to uh, renew that committee again. And just a question for you about your bill. Um, if that committee does start up again, it's my understanding that with your amendment, that data then will um, be shared again with that subcommittee. Is that correct? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair Moeller. Uh, yeah, it wouldn't stop that data from being shared if the subcommittee were to restart, um, but would just include that the data also be sent to those chairs and ranking members. All right, thank you. Uh, Representative Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, thank you to Chair Becker Finn. We had a conversation last night about um, this bill. I thank her for, um, you know, um, having that discussion with me. And I have to do a shameless plug here to, <laughs> to reconstitute. I have a, I do have a bill to reconstitute the Data Commission. It was kind of an oversight that it didn't get included to be renewed. And my bill um, would institute it as uh, with no fiscal note. At one point, we added. Um, a part-time um, staff person. So I think there was a $40,000 fiscal note, but the one that I introduced this year has zero cost. And um, I thank you Representative Moeller for being part of that commission in the past. And it's, um, it's, I think it's really valuable to get other members on a commission like that because of what you learn on that commission about data practices. And so that we, we kind of have a wider spreading of the knowledge um, needed in that area of, of law. So um, thank you for letting me give the shameless plug for that, Madam Chair, and um, I'll support your, your amendment today. Okay, let's see, any further discussion from members? All right, seeing none, um, let's see here. Uh, House file 1404 as amended is laid, oh, sorry, Chair Becker Finn, you get the final word. Yeah, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to follow up and say that um, I am completely open to continuing to have those discussions uh, with uh, with Representative Scott and with yourself, uh, Chair Moeller, uh, to discuss what might be the best uh, course moving forward. Also continuing those discussions with the Senate to see what might be able to be done this year. So uh, thank you uh, members for your support. And yes, would renew my motion that the, the bill be laid over and uh, you've got the power, Chair Moeller. All right, so House File 1404 as amended is laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Um, wow, great job everybody with all of the bills that we heard today under time. And I think Madam Chair, if it's okay with you, I can close us out here. Um, all right, so our next hearing will be on March 5th and the agenda is posted on our committee webpage. And with that members, the meeting is adjourned.